singing this morning that you that are thirsty, come, come. And so this morning, I'm going to invite you all to come right now and come forward for prayer. Now, we're going to believe God, hallelujah, this morning, hallelujah. That we start 2016 trusting in the living God. Casting all our cares before him because he cares for us. We're going to believe God for the impossible because God does the impossible. For he is able to take a wicked soul, hallelujah, change their heart and make them brand new in Christ Jesus. Cleanse us of all our stains and make us wide as full. This is the God in whom we serve. And I can't think of a better way this morning than us to just come and say, Lord, we are surrendering everything unto you. We're putting our families, our sons, our daughters, our husbands, our wives in your hand this morning. We're going to trust you, Lord, for the next hallelujah. 51 weeks, Lord, we're going to trust you, Lord, to make changes, Lord, in our home, in our neighborhoods, in our community, in our county, in our state, in this nation. Hallelujah. We're not talking about political changes. We're talking about life changing work of God, hallelujah. That the lost be found, hallelujah. The broken be made whole in Christ Jesus. And all we're saying this morning, hallelujah, Lord, we can't do it without you. We're trusting you. We're going to trust you, Lord, hallelujah. We've been praying about things that have not come to pass and God is saying today, today will you trust me? Will you lay it all down before me and just trust me to be God in your life? So, Father, we come this morning. We come, Lord, hallelujah, because, Lord, we are thirsty, Lord. We are dried up, Lord, and we have a cistern in us that is broken. And we need you to heal us, Lord. We need you to heal us of our doubt, Lord, of, 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 Lord, that hesitation, Lord, of surrendering it all before you, Lord. We need you this morning. We need you, Lord, to touch our hearts, Lord, remove the bitterness. To heal us of our disappointments of life, Lord. Help us to move past, Lord, ourselves, Lord, and enter into the promise of you that comes to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're believing you today, dear Heavenly Father, Lord. For restoration of life, Lord, I, I was talking to Jared's mother, hallelujah. And Lord, and he's tired of being tired, hallelujah. And all Mama said was, that's an answer of my prayers. He's saying what I want to hear. Hallelujah. But not because he's trying to please her, because, Lord, he's yours. Hallelujah. And he's been yours. Hallelujah. And you've just been waiting for him. You've been waiting for us to just say, Lord, I'm tired of being tired. I want you to be God in my life. What a great place to be this morning. Hallelujah. That we understand we need Jesus. And so if you're thirsty this morning, hallelujah, just lay it before him. Because see, the stream is flowing from Calvary's cross. The stream is flowing this morning, hallelujah. You can drink of the living water of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we come. And we come. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. We humble ourselves for forgetting what we thought we knew, understood, Lord. And we're just saying, have your way with us today. Have your way with us. We can't make them do it, Lord. We can't change nobody's mind. But, Lord, we're going to just bring them before you. Hallelujah. Because if you can save a rich like me, I know you can get them. I know you can draw them, Lord, to you. Because, Lord, we're not talking about those who lost, Lord. We're just talking about children of God, hallelujah, who have just been lazy. Or just had that measure of doubt, hallelujah, in their lives. They lack the faith, Lord, to just say, have your way with us. Lord, I don't know what it's going to be like, Lord, when, when we are a church, Lord, that's just going to run after you, Lord. I don't know what it's going to be like, hallelujah, Lord. I, I don't know what you're going to do, Lord, hallelujah. But if God be for us, who can be against us? For we can do all things through Christ, who is our strength. And so, Lord, we come this morning. As a people, Lord, humble ourselves before you, Lord. I come, Lord, as the under-shepherd, Lord, of you who is the great shepherd. And 
And Lord, and I can't do this without you. I need you this morning. We need you this morning. You called us to be light, Lord, and we don't know how to be light, Lord, except your light be in us. We want to live for you. We want to go for you, Lord. We want to do for you. Hallelujah. Lord, I, I'm praying today, Lord, for marriages to be restored. Hallelujah. Lord, and not only restored, I'm asking you to breathe life, Lord, upon those homes today, Lord. That they truly would be a home, Lord, led by you, not by husband, not by wife, not by my thoughts, my ways. Hallelujah. But leading by the Holy Spirit that is in us. I'm praying, Lord, that you would teach us how to be parents to our children. And I pray, Lord, for children to honor their mothers and their fathers. I'm praying today, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for employers and employees. That we understand, Lord, not one is greater than the other, but we must submit ourselves unto them who have authority over us. And so, Lord, I'm praying today, Lord, that we'll just be thankful. Thankful, Lord, hallelujah. I, I know that Amherst isn't right. I know Caterpillar is not right, Lord, hallelujah. I, I know that Kroger is not right and this one ain't right, hallelujah. But, Lord, we are your servants, Lord. It says, do all things as unto the Lord. Lord, I'm praying this morning, Lord, that we desire to get it right. That we desire to get it right, Lord, hallelujah. It's time. It's time, hallelujah. To believe, Lord, for miracles. Believe for healing in our bodies. Hearts to be transformed, hallelujah. The lost to be found, hallelujah, Lord. I pray this morning. And so, Lord, we come. We're at the, the stream of life. We are thirsting after you. Let us drink. And let us drink. And let us drink. And let us drink. Let us drink, Lord, from the water, from the well that will never run dry. So, Lord, I thank you this morning. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for who you are. I thank you, Lord, for how you pour it out upon us, washed over us in heaven. You're the God of the heart who mourns. Hallelujah. Be with Sister Brown, Lord, this morning. Hallelujah. Be with Brother Elmer, Lord, this morning, Lord, is our prayer, hallelujah. Be with the Booth family, Lord, hallelujah, this morning, Lord, hallelujah, be glorified, be glorified, hallelujah. Lord, we come this morning, hallelujah, laying it all down, Lord, because we don't get it. We don't know how you do what you do, Lord, but we're going to trust you, Lord, to do a complete work in us. So, Lord, today, today, we are going to say yes and amen to you. Yes, yes. For your glory. For your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes. Give the Lord praise. Amen. Give the Lord praise.
everything's getting back in the swing here. It's a normal week next week. Uh, please make sure you sign the registry books in the pews and pass them down. So we know who's out, not feeling well, and needs to call from the church. Birthdays this week. Janet Hartford, Sandy Van Houten, Naomi Barnett. Happy birthday. Men's group this week, uh, 6 o'clock, Tuesday night. We're back in the swing of things again here. Uh, you'll notice in the bulletin here, inside, car shower. Uh, Louise Byron is celebrating her 90th birthday this month. So her address is here. Thank you to ask if we would just shower her with cards. Just let her know, bless her, and let her know that we're thinking about her and care for her very much. Uh, youth group, Wednesday night prayer, meal, Bible study, all that's happening again this Wednesday, so there's a lot going on. We're glad you could be here with us this morning. Oh, yes, right, Fisherman's Club, Saturday morning, 7? 7 30, Fisherman's Club, Saturday morning, Fellowship Hall. We prepare our hearts this morning to get to God. Amen. God's already had a prayer. Amen. Amen. And so as we prepare this morning to give, let us be mindful that we give unto Him. We pray this morning that we understand who has blessed us and how He's kept us along the way. I was looking here where it says the mission statement. We will do whatever it takes to help non-Christians and nominal Christians become deeply committed followers of Jesus Christ. It has reached the outreach ministry happens not only in our community but around the world and it comes through your giving. The lives are touched that the work can go on. And so, to do this, to touch lives, it takes work, it takes effort, and it takes gifts. And so as we give this morning, let us understand we're giving for the work of the ministry of Jesus Christ, that lives will be touched and lives will be transformed forever and ever and ever. Amen. And so as we do now, come and wait upon us.
We believe that the Word became life and dwelt among us. We believe that God came on the cross, died for the sins of the world. We believe He was buried and He rose again. We believe that He ascended into heaven and all power has been given to Him. We believe, hallelujah, this morning, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the mercy and grace you have poured out upon us. We thank you for your love that has no end. Now, Lord, we ask that you would bless the tithe and the offering and use it to the purpose of your kingdom for your glory. Because we believe, Lord, that Jesus with a little can do great and mighty things. And now to your praise and glory, we surrender it all to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
But one story in Luke 2, chapter, uh, verses 25 and 26, is about a man named Simeon. And Simeon was a really old man. Older than anybody in this church. And we got some old people here. He was even older than me. But, <laughs> but he was really old. But God, he knew that God was going to save him. And God had promised him that he would get to see the Savior before he died. So, what did we celebrate before New Year's? Christmas. And what is Christmas? Jesus' birthday. Very good. So, a few days after Jesus' birthday, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple to dedicate him to God. Now, I remember not too long ago, <laughs> I don't remember how long ago, where's Katie? Here she is. Um, there was a couple here in church, right in the Gretchen Dom, that brought Caleb up from to dedicate him to God. And you know what that means? That means that they promised to teach him about God, to teach him what the Bible says, to teach him what he's supposed to do and not do. And Pastor Money stood up there and made all of us promise to have. Everybody in this church made a big promise to help each and every one of you learn about God and learn what the Bible says and what's right and what's wrong. Well, that's what Mary and Joseph were doing. They took Jesus to the temple to dedicate Jesus to God. He guess who was there? Who do you think was at the temple? Simeon. Simeon was there, the old old man. And as soon as he saw the baby, he knew it was the Messiah, the Savior. And he walked over and he asked Joseph, Mary, if you hold the baby, he took the baby in his arms and he looked up and said, Thank you, God, for letting me see the Savior. Thank you for keeping that promise. And there's story after story after story about how God keeps his promises, and there's a lot of promises God made to us. And we always know that he's going to keep the promises, right? Right? No. <laughs> so, what should we do? Keep our promises to God. I want you to repeat after me. Everybody, I meant what I said. I meant what I said. And I said what I meant. I said what I meant. I'll be faithful to God 100%. 100%. All right. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Lord, so much for all the promises you have kept, and please help us, help us to keep our promises to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One more thing before you go. What else happens on New Year's Eve? At midnight. The ball drops. The ball drops. <laughs>
We're not just here on Sunday morning to sing some songs. That's not worship. We're here to lift our praise upward. Um, we're going to sing the song of communion. And then we're going to do communion. We're going to do the Lord's Supper here. We're going to take of the blessing. Yeah. And, and when, you know, Pastor ask you to say amen, or I ask you to sing, or we keep singing the same song again. That is that is the spirit working, that is the spirit knowing this. And, uh, amen. Amen. That says it all. Let's stand and let's look for praise here. This is the body.
that every time we take this, we are mindful of God's unfailing love towards us. Amen. Amen. And so the Word of God tells us, the teaching that I gave you since that Paul talked about that he received from God, that on the night that the Lord was handed over to be killed, that he gave thanks and he prayed for us. Would you pray? Dear Heavenly Father, in this season of our Savior's birth, we pause to remember what transpired on the cross. We were taking a terrible journey of the ice and the horses and the mountain. We can't understand the pain that we have to do with them. But we have hope because it is not peace. And the day will come when we all Jesus was with the disciples and they reclined at the table. And he said to them, I eagerly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until the fulfillment of the kingdom of God has come. And he said, he took the bread and he blessed it and he passed it unto them. And he said to them, this is my body, which has been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat.
began on the night when the Lord suffered, and he was handed over to be killed. The Word of God tells us that he took the cup and he prayed. And he said, now give thanks to the blessing, the cup of blessing, for it symbolizes the blood of Christ. Father, we thank you that by the blood of Jesus that we are healed and we have reconciliation and redemption with you. Father, I pray that we partake of the cup that we will reflect upon the power of Calvary and we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
the importance of this time in our service is so critical for the children of God. In the covenant of God that is never broken. God's promises have no end. And so when we take communion, we are mindful of the promise that is everlasting, that Jesus says, I am coming back. Over the past five weeks, we talked about, before that at Christmas, we talked about the Advent candles, that of peace and hope and joy and love. And all of those were the promises of God returning one day. The Advent was about us looking forward into the future and understanding that God was come, is coming back. And so as we take of the cup today, it is again remembering God's eternal promise to us. I will come back and I will drink with you again of the fruit of the vine. And so as we look at the word of God this morning, we want to look at the same scriptures we looked at last week. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5, would you stand for the reading of the word? And let us read the word together. Ready? Read. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Jesus' word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when the people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wandering off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Father, we come this morning and we thank you for the truth of your word. Your word that is transforming, your word that gives life to us. And I pray this morning, Lord, that we would have a heart that is open to your word. And so, Lord, I ask that you now give us a heart to receive as we have ears to hear. And then I pray, Lord, that we would not lose heart and we would have courage, Lord, to walk out the fulfillment of your calling in our lives. We ask your blessing upon your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As I said to you last week, I said that we were at a crossroads as a church. I do believe that. I do believe that we're at a time where God is saying, what you have is good, but would you choose to walk into my promise? I believe that we're like that of the children of Israel. We're at a place now that we can trust God. I believe we have crossed the Red Sea. I believe that we have entered into the land. And I believe that the promise of God is waiting for us, that we can take and possess, that we can walk in the fullness of what he has for us as a body of believers. Or I can believe that we can doubt and we can spend the next 40 years doing a good thing but just wandering, not completing all that he has promised to us. And it would be a good thing. But would you not desire to walk in the promise of God and the fullness of all that he has in store for us? And so as we look at the word this morning, I want us to be mindful that we are talking about the power of the word of God, the power of new life that has been given to us, the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. I shared with you that in 2011, that we began with, tell your storms about your Jesus. For such a time as this, God had put us together. That in January 2012, on that first Sunday of the, the new year, that we looked at Romans 8 and it talked about more than conquerors. For victorious living, I must live in Christ and not in my circumstances. And if God is for us, who can be against us? In January 6, 2013, we talked about from John, first John chapter 2, that we would trust God with our lives and bow by our faith in Jesus through the finished work of the cross, so abide in his love. That in 1 John chapter 2, it talked about abiding in the love of God. That means staying put, trusting in. So desire Christ above everything, a 
abide, stay in Christ, and be faithful to Him. January 5th, 2014, we read out of Isaiah 55, and we said that God says what He means, and it's a good word, Susie. God's promises. What He says, He means. And when we looked at those texts, we looked and we went through that year with the idea that we can trust God, that we can trust His Word in every circumstance, situation, and promises uh, that He gives us are everlasting. And just as His mercies are new every morning, we can rejoice in Him. For in Isaiah 55, He said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. My word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. And the word part of that text that I wanted us to get down in our heart through that year was that, but it will accomplish what I please. And I found comfort in that word, and I pray that you would have found comfort in it as well. That what father, what mother, what loving parent would not want their child to find comfort in his promises. That we could trust his word. That we could believe him for everything in our life. And then last year, we looked at the word of God, and we looked at it from Romans 12, verses 1 and, 1 and 2. And we talked about that we needed to have a transformed mind. If I have my mind fixed on Jesus and his teachings, his ways, living to bring glory to Christ in all that I do and say, I had to come to understand that it would take a transformed heart to produce a transformed mind that would cause a person like me to desire Christian living. And so be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is for our lives. As we go into this year, I want to, and I shared with you last week, and I'm sharing it again today, that I believe that this is the thing for us as a church. I ask you, what do you want? What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be about? As a church, what do we want to be? What do you want to be in Christ Jesus? How would you like to be looked upon and how would you like people to perceive who you are to Christ Jesus? And the Word of God tells us that as children of God that we've been called to serve Him. And so my question is, where do you want to be? Now we can wander on for the next 40 years. We'll do a great work. We'll see the glory of God because they saw the glory of God in those 40 years. But they never walked into the promise. God has called us to be a light in the midst of darkness. And I believe that First Baptist Church is called to be a beacon light in this time in which we live. We talk about this in dark days that if there's anything that we see in the world that we find that the world is needing of a Savior. But for them to see a Savior, they're going to have to see a light. And that light has to come from you and from me. It has to be that that we begin to be, um, to broadcast, begin to live out with faith, trusting God. I believe that one of the hardest things as a believer in Christ Jesus is dying to self. Dying to self. As a believer, dying to self is one of the toughest challenges we're ever going to face. And it's not because we really want to be in control. The truth is, the wickedness of this sinful nature we have been born into is powerful. But the Word of God tells me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, or greater is he that is in me than this sinful nature I was born in. And if I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, then old things should pass away. Behold, I am new in Christ Jesus. But then I have to begin to picture myself as a person living after Christ. 
when we look at each other. It's a person that is staring at you. And so what I want you to do right now is just look to your left and to your right. The person that looked at you, do they see a powerful person in Christ Jesus? Do they see a born-again believer who is trusting in God in every circumstance, situation for their life? And the truth of it is, yes, they are. Because you have been saved by faith, you're a new creation. That's the promise of God. But the problem is, is that when they look at us, we don't feel like we are that person that God has called us to be. In fact, we can give 150 excuses of why we are not that person. But many of us are not that person is because I won't trust God. I'm afraid to trust God. I'm afraid to stand out different than other people. But the thing of it is, if you gave everything to Christ, and you gave everything to Christ, and you gave everything to Christ, and you gave everything to Christ, you gave everything to Christ, guess what we would look like? We would look like a people who has given everything to Christ. You wouldn't look strange, you would just look like the norm of the children of God. See, sometimes we pick out people who are committing their hearts to life to Christ that we say to them, man, there's something different about you. But the truth of it is, we should look like that person. We should desire that same thing that is in Christ Jesus. But if I'm going to do that, I have to die to self. But if I die to self, then it means I have to pick up something that is new to me strange to me, foreign to me, and that is living a life in Christ Jesus. See, religion isn't hard. Christians have done religion for thousands of years. That's not hard. Righteous living is what is difficult. Righteous living is that I'm choosing to live after Christ with everything that is in me. I want to please Him. Now, in the natural, it looks just like this. I desire to please her, but there's a lot of times that I don't. But I don't stop because the desire in my heart is to please her, and I am going to do that because why? I love her. And because we love Christ, we're not going to stop just because we come short of the glory of God. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we're going to say, Christ, I'm committing my heart to you completely. I know what you're thinking. If he did that, I would think I was married to an alien. <laughs> oh, here. Here, let me get that for you. Here. Sit down. Oh, let me massage your feet. But I'm going to tell you, after a week of that, after two weeks of that, after a month of that, after six months of that, you know what would begin to happen? She would say, oh, I thank God, you're the man I've been praying for all these 46 years. And vice versa. And all of a sudden, what we begin to do is begin to say to other men and women, this is what marriage looks like. And then you say, well, you guys never fight. You never disagree. You say, no, that's not true. But we understand that what we're disagreeing about is never greater than the love that God has given to each other. Living for Christ is what God has called us to do. And what we're going to be challenged with from the rest of our days is that, am I in to follow after Christ? Jesus turned the water into wine. How do we know that that happened? The Bible says so. But what did it say? It said that they dipped into that earthen vessel that had been filled with water. They handed it to the magistrate, the person in charge, and he drank of it. 
And he said, usually at the end of the wedding, they bring out the rock gut stuff. But you have brought out the very best for the last. And those that were serving understood that water had been just turned into wine. But when Mary asked Jesus to do something, he said, Mother, this is not my hour to do this. For my hour has not yet came. But what he was saying to her was that I am going to take man who is mostly water and I'm going to pour and transform him into a new wine and a new vessel. And that's what he's done for us. But the only way we're going to know how real this is, we're going to have to begin to drink of it. We're going to have to begin to partake of it. We're going to have to begin to say yes and amen. Because you and I would like to say, that's not who I am. Have you ever said, that's not who I am? I know what the Bible says, but this is not who I am. Have you ever said that? Now you all just lie. <laughs> you said quiet. Oh, three people said yes. The truth of it is, is that as children of God, we are scared to enter into the promises of God. Even though we know that we are a new creation, and we are yet saying to God, we want to see the world transformed in Him, and yet we're not willing to be transformed in Him. So in 2 Timothy, this letter that Paul writes to Timothy says, I charge you, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word and be ready in season and out of season. Be ready to share this word of life that is in you, in season or out of season, when I feel like it and when I don't. That I'm just going to be about the things of God. But he says to preach the word ready in season or out of season. But the truth of it is that means live the word in season, out of season. Whether I wake up feeling bad, wrong side, I got some troubles in my life, does not matter. We are to live Christ before everyone in season or out of season. When things are up or when things are down, we're going to be about the things of the Lord. Because see, the word of God tells us that in those times of faith, Jesus reveals himself to us and lets us know that he is God in the midst of our circumstance and situations. I've wept with some families. Wept for some families, prayed for some families over the last several months. Loved ones who have went home to be with the Lord. And some of those families have thought, I don't know if I can make it. And I understand if they don't know Christ, that they can say to themselves, I don't know how I'm going to make it. But we who are in Christ Jesus has the Spirit of God saying, you got me. You got me. What do you mean you don't know how you're going to make it? You got me. You said, but my pain is so bad. And God says, you know, I'm hurting like I've never hurt before. And he goes, yeah. I've never been in this situation before. He says, I understand. But you have me. Yes. What does that look like? That means in the midst of my heartache, I have peace that goes beyond my understanding. I'm able to rejoice because the mighty God has touched my life and transformed me to let me know that he has me. And if I know that he has me, why am I afraid? Why am I afraid to know that God is God in the midst of my circumstances and situation? He's got us. In the midst of a bad marriage, how do you, how do you, how do you get past it? How do you get past it? You're sitting in church, you're, you're, you're wanting God to make a difference, but we've been at this for so long, God, you don't understand that woman you gave me. 
That's biblical. <clears throat> and God says, but you don't know me who saved you. I will show you how to love her and you will see it by the way I have loved you. Has God not loved us in our bad days as well as our good? When we've dropped the ball, when we haven't even seen the ball. Huh? Huh? And everyone said amen to that. Most of us mentioned. All I'm saying is that here he's saying, Timothy, I want you to be about me in every circumstance, situation you're facing. And I want you to do that that I have told you to do it and God has revealed to you. And you can do this whether it's a good day or a bad day because God is in you. And if I know that God is in me and I know that God is greater than my circumstances and situations, then I begin to rejoice in him because there is nothing that is going to cause me to be separated from the Christ that I have living inside of me. So he says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. But he says, and be able to reprove, rebuke, exhort, correct people, guide people, Expect of people. And then he says encourage people. See the problem with Christianity is that, that we have struggled with. Is that we have lowered the expectation of Christ in each and every one of us. If I don't raise it too high for you then you won't raise it too high for me. But Jesus is saying to us the expectations I have for you are this. They're this. And if you think you can get to there, then it'll be here. And if you think you can get to there, then it's going to be here. Because why? He says, I want you to experience knowing me as God in your life. To experience knowing that I am God and I'm greater than any circumstance, situation that you're facing. That I am God that I will bring you new life and I will give you hope. I will tell you that I'm greater than your circumstance, your situation, and you can say to your storms, let me tell you about my Jesus. Because see, if we're going to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, he said be ready to preach the gospel, and that gospel is God is greater than every circumstance, situation you'll ever face, and Jesus is your only answer. Now, if Jesus is our only answer, that means I have come to a place of experiencing that there is no other answer for my life than Jesus Christ. Ruth wanted a man, and God gave her Boaz. Boaz wanted a woman, and God gave him Ruth. There was a Boaz, and there was a Ruth for every man, every woman. So then all I have to do again is to trust God in that circumstance situation. It's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives within me. If God says to me, if you don't work, you don't eat, and I'm putting in applications for a job, I'm not going to get frustrated because 60 people turn me down. I walk into the place, the 61st place, and I begin to go in there rejoicing because why? God's got a job for me. Those other 60 were not for me. He has a job for me. He says, I don't want you running after things that are going to satisfy your flesh. I want to bless you in it. Just trust me in this. Yes. If I begin to trust him in this, then I go in there with the confidence of knowing God's got something for me. Because if I get this down in my knower, I'm going to say to that other person who says, well, I put in 10 applications and nobody's hired me. I put in 70 before I got the job, but when I got that job, it was a godsend. This is what he wants us to know about. He wants us to be able to share with other people about an almighty God who does miraculous things. 
He wants us to understand that we can say to them who have no hope, you need Jesus. How do you know I need Jesus? I can look at you and tell you need Jesus. I've listened to you for the last hour. You need Jesus. You make it sound like Jesus is my only answer. Jesus is our only answer. There is no other answer. For victorious living, there is no other answer than Jesus Christ. So he says to Timothy, you may have to correct. You may have to get people off of, of this place and get them to this place here. You may have to say to them, what you're doing will not work. And then you encourage them. And then he says, you do it with complete patience and you do it with teaching. See, don't tell me what I need to do without showing me and giving me the things I need to make it happen. But he says the time is coming when people will not endure to sound teaching. But having itchy, itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. It's important that we understand this. Because I can go and find anybody out there on the internet that will agree to things I want to hear. It may not line up with the word of God. And they may say they are pastor so-and-so, prophet so-and-so, elder so-and-so. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's not the word of God. Pastor, honey, you think you know everything. I don't know squat. But I know that the word of God is life. I know the word of God is truth. I know the word of God is transforming. I know the word of God will never change. And because of that, I can say to someone, you need Jesus. And if you allow Jesus to come into your life, your life will never be the same. You will find that God is real. He will prove himself to you. How do I know? He wants to prove himself to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. He wants to show himself. But if I tie up his hands, the best he can do is heal a few sick folks. That's the best he can do. That's what the Bible said. He went to his own hometown, and they said, okay, we know his mom, his dad, we know his brothers and sisters, we know, who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Well, over there, he did this, he did this over there, and he, blind people are getting sight and lame are walking, and he's doing all these things there. Yeah, but we know him. See, what it says is that I've been in church all my life and we've never done church like that before. We've never believed that. We've never done all of these things there. And so the best we can get is that every now and then somebody with a sniffle says, I no longer have a cold. Right. Right. Well, guess what? If you take the medicine for two weeks, you will not have a cold. That's what the doctor said. Two weeks, that's about what it runs.
I'm doing this because you see that I changed. I've been doing good for three weeks. Don't you see the change? See, that's your problem. You're blind. You don't see nothing. But when she comes and says, you're changing. God says, see, I told you I can do this. But God, I was like this for so long. He says, yeah, I know. You were wandering in the desert, and you weren't looking to me. You weren't allowing me to be God in your life. Oh, you can quote the scriptures, but you weren't allowing me to chance, transform your way of thinking. He goes on to tell us, they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. They'll get off track. See, I, I know there's some things out there that work for growing the church, but nothing works any better than if I be lifted up, I will draw all men right. unto me. I know it's better than that. Exalt Christ in everything that we do and see what he will not do in the midst of a generation that is lost. And that's for you. Always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill the ministry. So when Matthew 8 tells us, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, it tells us beforehand that Jesus said, all authority and power has been given to me. It tells me of power and authority from heaven and on earth. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. So there, go for and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. If we're going to grow as a church, I have to begin to put into practice what Jesus has said, what the Word of God has said. Victorious living is being obedient to the things of God. Because God says, I will prove to you what is my good, acceptable, and perfect will is for your life. If you allow me to transform the way you think that you might begin to live the life I've called you to. The importance of this is because I believe that we as a church have been called for great things. For great things. Not mediocre. Not so-so. Not all right. That will do. But great things. And that great thing is is that we will go out and share hope with everyone that comes in our path. Now the word of God says, he that plants is nothing and he that waters is nothing, but he that brings to increase. But if we will be people that will say, Jesus is the answer, and if you're not sure that Jesus is able to transform your life, just watch me. Say that to your sons and daughters. Say that to your, your brothers and your sisters. Say that to your mate. If you're not sure if Jesus is real, just watch my life. If you've been praying for him, now it's just time to live it up. It's just time now. God says, okay, I've heard your prayers. Let's do it. I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's do it. I'm all in it. Let's do it. Can we just huddle together? All put our hands together. And then we just pray and say, yeah, let's go out and just do it. That's what he's calling us to. But it begins with me willing to be transformed. To change the way I think. To change the way I do. Because see, it begins when I know there is no other answer than Jesus Christ. I know there's nothing that is able to change a life than Jesus Christ. I will never be able to convince anybody with my intellect. Because every time you give them a theorem, they'll give one back to you. Anytime you say this is how it's done, they'll tell you no, it ain't. Because I have collected, I've accumulated others that disagree with what you're saying. But when the proof is in the pudding, that Christ transforms lives, that he's able to do exceedingly above all that we've asked and hoped for, all of a sudden you cannot deny that evidence of truth. Jesus did a lot of miracles. They did not say that the miracles in the Bible, you can't find where they said that the miracles were not real. 
that they were not true. They hollered at Jesus because they said, you say you're God. You said, your sins are forgiven. And he said, what is your question? To say your sins are forgiven? Or to take up your bed and walk? So the man picked up his bed and he walked. But that's a great thing. Healing is a great thing. But everlasting life yes. is everything. That's right. That's right. It's everything. And that's what the child of God is offering to a lost, dying generation. That eternal life in Christ Jesus is the fix-all of every circumstance, situation, eternity in Christ Jesus. There's nothing like it. And if you say yes and amen to Jesus, your life will never be the same. He will show himself to you. So do we want to be a church? That's just so so. All right. We'll do a good thing. We'll continue on and people will say, boy, you guys do a great, you guys do a great work. Boy, nobody's doing what you're doing. Or do you want to see the evidence of what God can do when he brings forth the increase? Do we want to wander? Or do we want to take what God has poured out into our hearts and begin to put it into practice? This year is a transforming year for us. It's going to be a year that we will see the glory of God in our lives. You will see the answers of prayers. You will see the glory of God being revealed. You will see hearts being touched, people being transformed. You will see people that were so lost, being so saved, that it will almost scare you. And God would say, compared to eternity, it's nothing. That's just a glimpse of what eternity is going to be like. But it begins with the church saying yes and amen to him. Yes. Now the truth of it is, for many years I have been scared to give Jesus everything. To let him be God in every circumstance, situation. There have been times in my life that I thought, God, I'm kind of out there by myself. And, you know, it's like the military. And we're going to close. It's like the military. They're all standing in the line. And they said, we got a dangerous mission. I just need somebody to step forward. And all of a sudden, the whole line took a step back. And I felt like, God, I'm not sure if I want to volunteer for this. I'm not sure that I want to be everything in you. I'm not sure I, I, I want to die to self. I'm not sure, Lord, if I, I want to stand on your word. I, I would feel better if everybody would step back up. But I'm just telling you today, if you step up, and 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 you step up, guess what? We'll all look alike. Doing different things. But what have this one common denominator is that we're so out to Jesus. I don't want to be and do just a good thing. God says, you will do greater things because I go to the Father. I'm ready for us to roll up our sleeves. I'm ready for us to get into greater things in Christ Jesus. Two thousand sixteen is our breakout year. It will be the most powerful time and experience of your Christian life if you'll trust God. You will not be in it by yourself. 
Where two or three gather in my name, there I shall be also. There's going to be two or three of you in that row, that row, that row, this section, that section over there, up there as well that are saying, I'm all in. And you're going to find out it's going to be contagious. Or well, it's going to be difficult after a while, at first, at first. Because he will say, well, you can be sold out, but I'm, I'm not sure. But, hey, go to all the meetings you want to, pray all you want to, but don't, don't call me or expect me to do all those things that you're doing because I don't think it takes all of that. He may say to you, I'm going to this, I'm going to that, and you'll say, go ahead and go. But don't expect me to go after all of that. It may put some friction in the house. I remember some 30-something years ago, working out in the yard, and she would say to me, Time for your Bible study. You better get going. I ain't going. Oh, I, I understand. He's made a change in your life. But I'm so damaged. I'll see. But one day she started joining me in those Bible studies. And for the next 30 something years, she has continued to join me in those Bible studies. Went by myself. You want him to come, just keep coming. Praise the Lord. You want her to come, just keep coming. Praise the Lord. And then transform in their presence and see what God will do. As we sang this song this morning, if you have never received Christ as your personal Savior, we invite you to come. If there's areas in your life that you're struggling with, you need prayer, we're going to invite you to come. If you desire to be a member of First Baptist Church, we invite you to come. Next Sunday, 9 o'clock, membership class will start in Barbara Grant's office. If you desire to be a member of First Baptist Church, we're going to ask that you come down, that we'll know, and then classes will start next week. Let the Holy Spirit lead
this morning. Our baby came down and said, I want to be a member of First Baptist Church.